qualify that idea, and it's it's the qualification that is needed in order to get the proper sense of the, um, the value for it. And the qualification really involves putting together the two ideas that we've just had. So, yes, the bad infinite will be the infinite of something other than the finite, but not just in the form of something positive, but in the form of that in which finitude has vanished, that which is the negatedness of finitude. So, the bad infinite in its full meaning you will equate with the non-finite. So yes, it's something other than the finite, but in the form of that which is not itself finite. <coughs> so that's what he's going to look at now. So having said that the infinite and the finite relate to one another as something another, and this falling back, by the way, into previous categories, happens at various points in the logic. You see it, for example, to be the logic of essence. When you get essence, what happens? Immediately it falls back into a relationship of being something and something else. So essence is something other than being. So you, this is not the only time that this, this occurs. But he says in the second paragraph under that this is not the only way in which, not, this is not the only aspect that needs to be brought out uh, in um, uh, these categories. So, but the infinite and the finite are not in these categories of relation only. The two sides are determined, are determined beyond the stage of being merely others to each other. They're not just others, but they are others. Finitude, namely, is limitation posited as limitation. Determinate being is posited with the determination to pass over into its in itself to become infinite. So it's not just that they're other than one another, but that the finite becomes the infinite. Infinity, therefore, is what Hegel calls the nothing of the finite. It's what arises through the ceasing to be of the finite. Infinity is what the finite is in itself. What it ought to be, but this ought to be is at the same time reflected into itself, is realized. So you can think of the finite as just ending giving rise to another finite. But in that process, it also, it also gives rise to being that itself is unending. And so it passes into unending being. And both of those results can be seen as the ought to be of the finite. What the finite ought to be is A, nothing at all, non-being, but B, Infinite being, infinite being, unending being, is what finite being is implicitly. It is also the negation of the finite, only as it were in a more positive form. So infinite being, finite being is born to die, but it's also born to be infinite being. And we've seen how, in fact, it comes to be the very infinite, unending being that it is born to be. And it comes to be that simply by ending. Okay, so we've got then these two ideas that now, in this section, the finite and the infinite are understood as other than one another, but not just other than one another, because the finite becomes the infinite as the nothing of the finite. We continue. In infinity, we have the satisfaction that all determinateness, alteration, or limitation, and with it the all itself, are posited as vanished, as sublated, that the nothing of the finite is posited, because the finite in ending proves to be unending being. And this negation of the finite, the in itself, is determinate, and thus is affirmative within itself. So you have the infinite as something affirmative that is the negation of the finite. Both of those are derived from the thought that infinity is the negation of the finite. Infinity is the negation of the finite as 
the nothingness, the negativeness of the finite, where there is no finitude, but it's also the negation of something other than the finite. So it is something other than the finite where there is no finitude. That is the bad infinite. And that's why Hegel goes on to describe it as the non-finite, das nicht endliche. Being with the determinedness of negation. So just again, to get this, it's, it's, if you think that you've got uh, the finite, obviously ends, it, it disappears, it becomes what? Another finite. But that another finite is something negative. Okay, it's not the first one, the first one ends, and it becomes another finite. In that process, though, Hegel thinks there is a continuing being, unending being. So finitude in ending becomes unending being. That unending being, insofar as it is unending being, is not finitude. It's qualitatively different from it, the qualitative negation of it. That's why he says finitude vanishes in the infinite. Insofar as the finite proves to be infinite, finitude as such vanishes momentarily. But this unending being is itself negative. It's unending being. It's the negation of being that ends. And through the logic of Dasein and something, being a negation of finitude turns the infinite into something other than finitude. So you get then the finite and you get over here the infinite, which is something other than that. So that's what we know in the first paragraph of beta. But then what he highlights in the second paragraph is just the original thought. That the infinite is still where there is no finitude. It's still where finitude has vanished. So the infinite is something other than the finite, but as the negatedness, the having vanished of the finite. And that's why he calls it the non-finite. That's nicht entity. And it's that idea that the infinite is a sort of emptiness beyond the finite. That's the bad infinite. That infinite is something that's negative. It's a sort of uh, a void beyond the finite. We're here, and then out there somewhere is the infinite, the void, which is beyond where we are now, and is the negation of everything we are now. It's just that's the bad. Infinite. And the word is bad, schlecht, not spurious. It's the bad infinite. Bad doesn't mean, okay, we're not, we don't get moral here. This is not a sort of a morally dubious one. It's bad quite simply because it's not true infinity. It's an infinity that's still caught up in the categories of finitude. It's other than. It's the simple negation of. And we don't need to know what true <coughs> infinity is to know that this is bad. That's really, remember, Hegel's logic is imminent on the way I'm reading it, what comes later plays no role at all and can play no role in getting us to there. Shelley, it seems to me, is absolutely wrong. And if there's one, I'm not presupposing that, I just don't think that's the way it works. And so this is also a place where we know that the infinite is bad here, not because we know what the true infinite is, but because we know that's an infinite that's bound up with infinitude, that's a finite infinite. All right, so let me just read you a couple of paragraphs then. I'm, I've sort of, I haven't gone through every single sentence of that second paragraph uh, because it is, it is quite knotty and tortuous. But the basic idea I think I've, I've, I've tried to give you. The infinite is other than the finite, but as the negatedness of the finite. So it's the non-finite. He then says, the infinite as thus posited over against the finite in a relation wherein they are as qualitatively distinct others, is to be called the spurious infinite, 
the infinite of the understanding. This is what the understanding thinks infinity is. Sort of a beyond. For which it has the value of the highest, the absolute truth. The understanding is satisfied that it has truly reconciled these two, but the truth is that it is entangled in unreconciled, unresolved, absolute contradiction, because it's entangled in a finite infinite. Um, this contradiction occurs as a direct result of the circumstance that the finite remains as the determinate being opposed to the infinite, so that there are two determinacies. There are two worlds, one infinite and one finite, brackets, for the understanding, close right. And in their relationship, the infinite is only the limit of the finite, and is thus only a determinate infinite, an infinite which is itself finite. This is one of the most famous uh, of Hegel's analyses, and even philosophers who are skeptical of Hegel are very uh, impressed by it, and Derrida being one of them. I mean, this is one of the arguments that, that Derrida thinks is right. Doesn't mean that he's not trying to sort of get out from underneath the skin of Hegel in some ways, but this is right. Um, and it's a version of the idea, of a broader idea that Derrida's interested in Hegel, and that is that if you oppose X, you end up being the mirror image of X. Which, of course, is why he can't oppose Hegel. Because if he opposed Hegel, he'd just be the mirror image of Hegel. So the very way in which Derrida approaches Hegel relies on accepting that Hegel's right about this, and right about the broader point that if you oppose X, you're just the mirror, mirror image of X. That's so it's worth it. And I suppose, to be honest, putting my cards on the table, it's why of all the 20th century French philosophers, Derrida is the one I'm most drawn to, because he seems to be the only one who actually understands what Hegel's doing. Foucault doesn't, Deleuze doesn't, Levinas certainly doesn't, Lyotard doesn't. I mean, obviously, you know, Hippolyte, Jean Val, Eric Val, I mean, they're, 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 they're the ones that get neglected. They understand what's going on. But Derrida seems to be of the greats, is the one who has the, the closest uh, understanding of what's going on. All right, this idea of the two worlds, um, he continues on then in the next paragraph. Um, I'll skip the first few lines and then look at the, uh, the last um, uh, half of it. When, therefore, the understanding, raising itself above this finite world, ascends to this highest of the infinite, this finite world remains for it on this side, so that the infinite is only set above or beyond the finite, is separated from it, with the consequence that the finite is separated from the infinite. Each is assigned a distinct place, the finite as determined to be here on this side, and the infinite, although the in itself of the finite, nevertheless, is a beyond in the dim, inaccessible distance, outside of which the finite is and remains. So the idea of a beyond, the infinite as a beyond, is um, what's generated <coughs> and is constitutive of the notion of a bad infinite. Um, now, without giving too much away, Hegel is critical of this. Okay? This is not what true infinity will prove to be. But what's interesting is comparing Hegel's account of how this idea arises in the first place with, for example, Nietzsche, which is obviously what I did in my PhD in the first book. And this is this is the aspect of Hegel that I suppose got me initially interested. That both Hegel and Nietzsche are critics of the beyond. So how can that be, given that they're so different on the surface? They have different accounts of how the beyond arises. Nietzsche's you're familiar with, you know, has to involves um, uh, a certain conception of, of life declining life, resentment, you know the whole story. Hegel's is purely categorical. If you want to ask what's generated the beyond, what's generated is simple negation. Thinking of the infinite as simple negation. So not thinking of the infinite properly, but being, as it were, blinded by the simple negation contained in the thought of das unendliche. If that's what you stick with, das unendliche, and you don't think it any further, you end up here. And that's what understanding does. And the idea of the different places is just, as it were, a kind of spatializing of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of that notion of a beyond. That I find that interest in um, spatializing this relationship interesting, because I think I might have highlighted it before. If you think of 
about Plato, Plato and the forms, for Plato, as Hegel reads Plato, the forms are imminent in things. They're not beyond. So Hegel has a very different reading of Plato from Aristotle or Nietzsche, for example. Forms are imminent in things. So what's going on in the cave allegory when they're placed in different places? That serves educational purposes. That is misleading. On a Hegelian reading of Plato, that serves an educational function so that you can distinguish in the first place between the things of this world and forms. But, of course, the way you're doing it is by placing them in different places. You're placing forms in a relationship to things that is derived from the things beyond which the forms are supposed to be. So I'm kind of reminded of, of Hegel's understanding of Plato and his rejection of the idea that Plato is a two-world thinker. And it connected here to... Well, Hegel's not rejecting it here because he hasn't shown that there's anything wrong with it, despite the use of the word schlecht. Well, I mean, I suppose, okay, it's contradictory, but he hasn't shown what the resolution would be. Let's put it this way. Hegel hasn't yet shown that there's an alternative to this bad incident. Okay, I think I'm going to stop at that point. Um, there is more to come, but I think this will be a good... We've covered quite a lot, and um, I think this will be gives us plenty of time to... Um, Reflect. I, I don't mind going over any arguments if you want to go over the details of them, or if you just want to think about the implications of them, or any thoughts that pop into your mind. About, um... Yes. Come yeah, so the, something that I saw as quite interesting was the idea of the um, the order of the should, mm -hmm. because saying that there's um, almost that there's a relationship between the thing and then that which it should be sounds very much like you have a set well, it's, a it's a relation between the limitation of the thing and that which the thing should be. Should be. Yeah. The, the thing is, is, is that relation, I suppose. Um, sounds very much like you have a standard for what that thing should be. Um, yes. Insofar as... Um, you know, the bag is, um, you know, it's limited because, you know, it has to and that's it. Mm -hmm. But it should be something like this. Mm -hmm. It's not soft. Because for that, it sounds like, well, surely you could just say, well, okay, you can, you know, obviously you can have an understanding. I mean, you know, perhaps even, you know, some of, say, Nietzsche's critiques, mm -hmm. he talks about, you know, imposing a sort of value onto objects, right? So, you know, you could say, well, is it really the case to say, you know, your bag has a sort of, that its sort of limitation hints at what it should be, or is it just simply a bag, an object, well, you know, that's just in and of itself? Why is there this sort of, why does Hegel think there's this sort of move towards it? Ah, good question, good question. And in a way, you've almost sort of seems to be answered it in the way you've given the question. <laughs> Because the idea of the should is the correlate of the idea of limitation. So, if the limitation is an internalized limit, and it is essentially a negative moment, then it's got to be within the logic of being a negation of, a limitation on. So the question is, what is it a limitation on? Well, normally you would just say, well, there's a limitation on what the thing is. So you've got what the thing is, and it's got a limitation. The problem is, though, that separates the being of the thing from its limit, which is back where we were with limit. But now we've the two come together. The limitation is now imminent in the thing. It's now constitutive of what the thing is. So what the limitation is a limitation on is, yes, the being, the intrinsic being of the thing, but in an attenuated sense. A sense that's lost pure and simple being, because the limitation is now constitutive of the being of the thing. So that's what forces us in the direction of the mere should. The mere should, Zollen, is simply the thought of the being of the thing, the intrinsic being of the thing, 
insofar as it can be distinguished from the limitation of the thing, which limitation belongs to what the thing is. Now, can we, instead of looking at this bag and thinking of its limitation, just think of it as, as being what it is? Well, of course we can, yes. We can think of it as just something. It's something other than that thing there. Absolutely. But then we're not thinking it's finite. We can think that it has an intrinsic character. And the intrinsic character at the moment is that it's you know, pretty grotty and it's old and, and beaten up. And it also relates to other things, like the weather, and it relates to other things through the intrinsic character that it's got. So because it's got holes in it, let's order it, you know, for example. Yes, of course we can say all of that. But then we're not thinking it in its finitude as finite. So to think it as finite, if Hegel's argument is right, is to think not only that it ends, but that it is this relationship between its intrinsic limitation and, question mark, what has to be the correlate of the limitation? If the limitation belongs to the very being of the thing, then you can't see that limitation as a limitation on a simple positive being. It's got to be a limitation on a being that's been deprived of being, a being that only should be. So this is not an external standard. This is the standard, the should, is set by whatever the thing is. And it is that which the limitation prevents the thing from realizing. So the any, any finite thing not only is not only should be x, but the limitation is precisely what prevents it being that. Limitation is not just any old limitation, it's a limitation on that which prevents it being that. So if so this is why there's not an obvious starting point with all of this. It's a little bit like Nietzsche and Birth of Tragedy. Now which comes first, Dionysus or Apollo? Uh, each is each is not the other. <clears throat> Similarly here, the limitation is a limitation on what the thing should be. And it, it limits the thing precisely by preventing it from being what it should be, but it should only, only should be that in the first place because its limitation stops it being that. They, they kind of come together as a package. That's the idea. But absolutely, one doesn't need to think of things in this way. If you don't think of them as finite, then you don't think of them this way. And we didn't think of them this, this way you know, two weeks ago. We thought of things as being other, or as having an intrinsic identity. And indeed, later, we'll think of them in different ways, having quantity, having a measure, having an essence, being mechanical, being, you know, they'll be... So does that help? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just obviously, like, uh, from a sort of preliminary sort of um, exposition, you're sort of thinking, wait a second, how is it done without referring to sort of a... Uh, external standard. I mean, perhaps you sort of take that with you, right? Sort of yeah, I suppose, why would you think it's an external standard? Um, the, the issue, the question is, how do we make sense of the idea of a schranke, of a limitation? If it's not a limit, a limit falls between A and B, according to A. A schranke is not a limit, but it belongs to and is constitutive of something by itself. So then I suppose the question to you would be, okay, what how are we to think what that limitation is a limitation on? What aspect of the finite something is to be thought in that space that the limitation is a limitation on? Given that it can't just be purely affirmative, because then we'd be back in the earlier thought. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, probably just a pitch in, I suppose. I mean, I suppose maybe one reason why this confusion might emerge is because the way Hegel talks about this. It seems that it works very well for natural objects in particular as they it seem to have their standards in them too, but right? you know, a natural object has its own tell us. Mm -hmm. And so you know, so an acorn is not a tree, it's just being a tree. But right? the bag is a human object. You know, in, in a way a standard isn't internal to it, because it is this way, because some Alright, well forget the example. As always, yeah. <laughs> this is it. I give examples yeah. because I know that these things can be difficult. If the examples are confusing, forget the examples, let's just go back to the book. And of course we're not dealing with either, there's no distinction there between natural and spiritual objects, between social artifacts. So that, I understand your point, yeah. but then that's bringing in an irrelevance, right. because we know we're not dealing with 
that the same. So it's not aggressive. I'm just saying it seems like it is, that's why the orange juice is aggressive with a natural object. I don't want to hear why a spiritual object has this kind of image to it. But I mean, the bag, for instance. I mean, in a way. Well, no, but that's not the question. Though. The Tom, the question is, what is it to be finite? Not what is it to be a natural object, but what is it to be a spiritual object? The, what we're focusing on is purely what is it to be finite? What can finite be and mean? That's the issue. And Hegel's claim is it means ending. First of all, that'd be hard to deny that. Although Spinoza does deny that, actually. For Spinoza, to be finite is to be limited by something of another kind. But even then, that other causes the thing to end. So even he has ending built in to be finite. And then you've got the second relationship, which is that it has this, the, the, the limit then belongs intrinsically to the thing. The finite thing has an intrinsic limitation. It really sounds like, I mean, on, yeah, this is just to help think yeah. through introducing this thing to be natural spiritual objects, which I know is anyway, certainly, just like some others, but <laughs> it, it seems like, I mean, okay, so obviously the back example isn't helpful, but it's illustrative, it's not helpful. <laughs> it seems like the bag doesn't have a standard given to it. All right, well then forget the bag. Well, you know, it. Forget the bag. It's, it's not, not fine over. Is the bag just not fine over? Well then, I, I, I said I'm not interested in the bag. Okay. I'm interested in what it is to be finite. <laughs> That's what we're thinking about. We've got to sort out what it is to be finite. And then we can go on and say, actually this bag is finite. It's not just finite, because right. as you say, yeah. it is purposeful. It's teleological. So you can't explain it unless you make reference to the logic of the concept, for example. It is a social product. It's a product, it's a historical product. You know, it's gradually becoming, for me, an object of veneration. You know, we're getting into this. You know. So, absolutely. That's one of the I was going to make. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you like the back, you can say no. But you don't want to do the work. Yeah, yeah. But then you see, then what you're doing, and this is why I said, think of it in terms of these sort of CAT scans going through, that, that clearly what any object, any real object in the world, is in fact, has a whole lot of different aspects to it. So, yes, we can't make sense of a bag in, without the world of spirit, without the world of human activity, making, <coughs> without, uh, you know, transport. I mean, there's a whole lot of other stuff that goes into this. So this is more different from a natural object. Um, but the question, and I think Hegel's claim would be, that to be something is to be finite. So, insofar as this is a something, it's finite. It's not exhausted by being finite. But what belongs to it insofar as it is finite, it's to have an, a limitation on what it should be. The should, insofar as it's finite, is the should that belongs to the thing. Insofar as it's not just finite but a social object, the should comes from the attentions I've got in using it. So actually, I think we can... So it's a good, good question because it helps separate out the different perspectives that we need for understanding things. And also maybe that makes reference, you know, helps you up with understanding your question as well, that, that, that if you're going on to think of, don't think of natural and, and, and human objects as just examples. They have additional features to them. Which go beyond what we've got here. Is that does that kind of? No, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah but um, yes, go ahead. In connection then, if I were to put on my Pippin hat, I would say <laughs> I have. Oh, you don't want to know, right? Okay. I have yeah. more about it. Yes. Um, if I were to put on my Pippin hat, I might want to say, um, at, at a certain point, I want to be able to say of such and such, use the resources of the logic to say of such and such that it is in such and such a way without further qualification with a level of epistemic certainty that couldn't be reached uh, by a paper in analytic metaphysics or something like that. I want to be able to say how things are. Yeah, I guess epistemic certainty isn't really possible. the top of our minds. That's it. We're, we're, we're interested in what is. But anyway, I, I, I get your point. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think what we're searching for is epistemic certainty. Okay, I think so we're so searching, searching for an understanding of what, of what there is. I suppose if you you must if, if you if you uh, have direct access to what there is, then it's just a power play. It's just a slightly weaker claim to say that you know what is. Um, anyway, yeah. but I know you know you don't take that view. What do you think would be the strongest way to argue, 
to argue for that view. Well, I'm, I mean, the idea that thought discloses the nature of being is, I suppose, the element of, of, of the logic right at the start. So I don't see the logic as returning to that problem. It seems to me that, that there are, as I say, there are two ways into the logic. I think the element of the logic is already one that goes beyond what Kant thinks. Now, Kant, as you know, thinks that, that through a concept you can only conceive what's conceivable. You can only think what's thinkable. You can't think what there is. Hegel thinks no. Through understanding properly, through reasoning, you disclose what there is. Now, is there anything in the course of the logic that proves that? Well, I don't know that there is, apart from the disclosure that being has this rational structure. I think that is partly meant to be grounded in the phenomenology, and partly also to be a corollary of this decision. Moving on to objects in nature um, as such, uh, I think that is, those are still, the philosophy of nature is still a continuation of the logic. And the philosophy of spirit is a continuation of the logic. Not reducible back to it, but a continuation of it. So the idea that through thought we disclose what is continues into the philosophy of nature. So through thought we disclose what is what it is to be space, time, matter, physical, chemical, organic beings. Now, where there is an element of judgment, I suppose Kant would call it, you know, mutter bits, I suppose you know, motherly wit. Um, is in determining what we say about specific objects in, in nature. But philosophy, as Hegel understands it, speaks about those objects only insofar as they exhibit and can be known to exhibit the categories that philosophy discloses. Everything else falls, over, falls uh, to science or, or everyday experience. So. Pippin's hat, well, insofar as it's something, Hegel thinks it will have this structure. Insofar as it is finite, it will have this structure. Insofar as it is one, it'll have this structure. Insofar as it's quantitative, it'll have this structure. Insofar as it has a measure, and so on and so on. Insofar as it's spatio-temporal, chemical, historical product, it will have those structures. Whatever other features, uh, the line, you know, the, the sort of, you know, the, the, the autographs you collect on it, for example, or the mud that, that's not of any interest to philosophy, Hegel would say. Maybe I'll, where does the want for my saying that it is finite over something or whatever come from? And how can I know, and how can I oh, say which restrictions there are? Right, on? okay, okay, that I take it, right, now I, I think, uh, uh, I, I have an article on, um, on the latest one I've done on Hegel and McDowell uh, is, is, is about this. I think there, um, there are two ways of approaching this. Um, one, it seems to me, is the one that, that you don't obviously like, which is one I've just given, which is that insofar as it is an object of nature or an object of spirit, it is you know, by definition structured by these things. Um, but the other one is like more epistemic, more from the side of epistemic. I take uh, Hegel in some sense to be somewhat close to Kant, that it's only <coughs> as far as it's thought in this way that it can be an object of experience at all. That the warrant, and this is the way I put it in, in, the, in, the, in the articles about, uh, about McDowell, the warrant can't be in the sensuous information we get about things. Because Hegel is Kantian, in this respect, namely that concepts have their source a priori in thought. Um, and I suppose they're both agreeing with you that sensory perceptions as such, to the extent that you can isolate them at all, only give you sort of particularity. They don't give you universality and necessity. So for Kant, they don't give you the categories. And I think Hegel's saying too, yes, they don't give you the categories. Categories have their source in thought. And so the warrant for thinking of your hat as a something <laughs> comes from thought. And if, well, as I say, I, I think I write in the, um, in the, in the article about the Tao that you know, if, you, if you 
ju- if you if you on the basis of your thinking take what is in front of you to be the branch of a tree, then it's got to behave in a certain way that conforms to what it is to be a branch of a tree. If it suddenly takes flight and goes tweet, it's obviously not a branch of a tree. And then you have a different way of conceiving it. But and I think that is I think from the epistemic side, that's quite right. So so what that why that is upsetting from the, from the point of the empiricist because from Hegel's point of view there is no empirical warrant for the application of categories. That's the empiricist dream that Kant's already shown to be an impossibility. It's the categories themselves that make sense of the empirical information. And they have to allow themselves, oh sorry, the empirical information has to allow itself to be conceived in a certain way. So if your hat behaves, A, as a hat is supposed to behave, and it doesn't suddenly take off and go meow. <coughs> and if it behaves in the way that a something behaves, you know, a quanti- quantifiable entity behaves, uh, and, and so on, then that's what it is. But of course, that's the element of judgment that relates to a specific thing, and that's not really the, the province of philosophy. I mean, there's another way of thinking about it, which is to start with what being must be, and to say that being must take the form of objects in space and time that have a physical, chemical, organic character, and indeed that produce beings like us that produce things like hats. Although, as far as I know, those are the category hat in the logic or the, or the philosophy of spirit. So that's, that doesn't arise there. Um, and so you might say, well, then there's, there's, there's a gap. But, but, but that's not what philosophy is interested in. There are lots of gaps. There's a lot that philosophy can't explain. And Hegel is quite explicit about that and doesn't aim to, which is why the people who think Hegel's out to explain everything are just wrong. It's as simple as that. Hegel's quite explicit in the philosophy of nature. Philosophy has limits. It doesn't explain everything. Because if it did, then science would be redundant, experience would be redundant. That is not <coughs> what philosophy is about. And it baffles me why people ever thought it was. You know? It, it, this is this is when Hegel objects to the idea of you know having to derive Krug's pen. He thinks it's absurd. Philosophy doesn't derive Krug's, Krug's pen. I mean that's you know, that has specific circumstances under which it was produced. So I think there are broad issues here, um, but I think this idea of the limitation is very is very important. Um, and I think it's also important to distinguish what philosophy is trying to determine, and then the specific judgments we make. On the basis of that. So, give another example, if I can, just while we're on this. Um, I, you know, some of you do the aesthetics next term. We'll have a similar issue with, for example, tragedy. Let's take Hegel has a very theory, famous theory of tragedy. And actually, it's an aspect of Hegel's thought that a lot of people like very much. I mean, they don't like actually everything about it, but, but they, you know, think that that, um, that it's a p- powerful theory. But it's very definitely normative, in the sense that it is setting out what it is to be a tragedy. It's not assuming that we know what tragedies are and then try to find what's common to them. So it might be the case, it might be the case that under a Hegelian account, certain plays by Euripides just aren't tragedies. Although, of course, we would call them tragedies, you would say, well, they're not, actually, they're not tragedies. Or a good example for me, because uh, this is something I studied when I was a student, I don't know if you know, um, uh, as a German playwright called Georg Büchner, who wrote Danton's Death and Wojciech, which is then turned to an opera by Alban Berg. Wojciech is not a tragedy on the head like that. It's very sad, um, you know, that Wojciech um, eventually sort of is driven mad and, and murders Marie, uh, his betrothed. The, why is it not a tragedy? Because Wojciech is a complete victim. He is done to by society. That's not tragic. Tragedy for Hegel is bringing yourself to your own end through your own actions. And indeed, if you're Greek, destroying yourself through doing the right thing. Hardest thing for a Greek to imagine. How can you do the right thing? And that is why you die. Now, so the argument then has to be, Hegel, you're wrong about what tragedy is. But the way he's thinking is that this explains what tragedy is. And then it's a matter of judgment, I guess, whether... Hegel is right about Antigone. Now, I think he has a good account of Antigone. But let's say 
Antigone was much more like Anui's Antigone, where it's completely one-sided. And let's say Hegel had missed that. Okay, he gets it wrong about the play. So that play is not a tragedy. So that's pretty much, you know, the same with philosophy of right. What is it to be free in the philosophy of right? Well, this is what it is to be free. Are there free states? Well, let's have a look. And in fact, he even puts it that way. He says, you know, philosophy derives the begriff, then you look for the Vorstellung to see whether it matches. And if the Vorstellung doesn't match, well, so much the, you know, the worse for the Vorstellung is the way that Hegel would And it seems to me that if you're a philosopher of a broadly Kantian rationalist um, character, which Hegel is, that's the way you think. Only if you're an empiricist, covert perhaps, would you want it to be different? Would you want to somehow take off from either what we regard as X's or, you know, as Aristotle does, what people say about X's? Yes. Yeah, it seems to me that we have to keep Hegel very abstract and it's like working with number in that sense. And then if the number sequence we have to see, like the Nazi sequence, comes out in um, petals or in flowers, which mm -hmm. it does, uh, then we're on to something. Yes, I suppose I think that's probably right, actually. Um, I mean, I think it's an odd kind of abstractness because it's an abstractness that actually does sort of concretize itself. But it doesn't concretize itself quite as far, I think, as, as, as Edmund is hoping. Um, but you're right, in a sense, on this idea of seeing a particular structure within something is pretty much the way, I guess, I would regard that the world between the logic and Hegel's philosophy and things. Um, Finitude is a bit different because it's, it's Hegel's claim here is that to be something at all is to be finite. So if we were to encounter something in the world that wasn't finite, well, I mean, for Hegel, we couldn't make sense of it. And of course, technically speaking, we wouldn't be able to encounter it because, because finitude you know, is a relative thing. There's simply the fact that it outlives us. You know, the sun is going to outlive us, but and so from our point of view, perhaps is not quite that. We know, we know that it is. Anyway, let's let's move. We've got a few minutes. Are there any other questions about the actual logic of it? And we've talked a bit about the status of what Hegel's doing, but about the actual logic of it. Um, Okay, I think that at that point, I was going to carry on, but I think it might be a good point actually to stop, if you don't mind, um, uh, rather than bringing in extra stuff. So what I'm going to do next time uh, is read, so actually I've got a bit of uh, advice for you about how to read what's coming. We look at, uh, what he, there's another, there, so we've had the first endlessness, and then unending being, and then the bad infinite. Then he goes on to what he calls the progress to infinity, which is a, a fourth form of infinity. Then we come to affirmative infinity. Now, by all means, read the whole thing. However, you could save yourself a bit of time if you read the first four lines of affirmative infinity on 143, and then skip to page 146 at the bottom. Um, a... Uh, it's, it's in a paragraph that says, in the first place, both the infinite and the finite are negated. And it's, it's a few lines from the end of that, where it says, but the infinite progress expresses more than this. OK, why do I suggest you skip those other pages? Well, because just before the but the infinite progress, you can read, we thus compare these two determinations in the separation, just as in our comparison, an external comparing, we have separated. So what he tells us here on 146, which he doesn't make completely clear on 143, is that what he's doing from 143 to 146 is an external comparing. So I think, okay, well, it would be nice to know that at the beginning, because in a way, if the logic is imminent, we don't really need to go through that. Um, and having worked through all this, I mean, as I say, I'm not saying don't read it. I would never say that. But if you want to save yourself a bit of time, and get to the main logical argument, you could go right from the beginning of affirmative infinity, the first four lines, to um, 
But this infinite progress expresses more than this. And that's where it picks up again. And so the true infinite comes in here. Um, and then there is uh, the, particularly the second remark on idealism. It's very important because um, what we haven't been discussed yet is what it means for Hegel to be an idealist. And it becomes clear in this remark. If you've done all of that, then I would say please lead on into being for self, being for one, and maybe go as far as the one and the void, which is about 165. I might get that far next time. Um, let's see. All right, thanks very much. I hope you have a good week, and I'll see you next